I had a gun put to my head straight away. I admit it, I pissed myself. Like, I was only a 14 year old kid, like, I'm afraid to admit it. And uh, I was driven about 30 miles to um, an orchard in the middle of Digcot. And um, I was told they were going to kill me, you know. I just had a blatant disregard for authority from that moment on. And I thought, right, that's it. I just went on a crime rampage. I was hurting people, like, so experimenting with more drugs, running away from home and doing some real crazy stuff. The police turning up at my house, looking for me every day. My mum telling them where I was. Started messing about with firearms at a young age, like 13 years old. I got two jam jars in, in a sock and I went and found him, done him in the showers. People getting melted with hot oil, you know, their faces getting melted off boiled up loads of butters, put them in a, in a saucepan and he threw it over him. And a guy put a bit of that blue kitchen towel on his face and oh, his, no. nose, his nose came off in his hand. Oh. And um, they told me they're going to cut me up in the morning, you know, like, you better get off the wing. And like, I didn't want to run off the wing, you know what I mean? But I did put a noose around my neck. And I feel confident in myself, yeah, that I am going to be on the right path now, you know what I mean? I don't want to face that demonic system ever again. Well said. And what I was picking at was my archery and I popped oh. my archery in my leg and um, all the blood, it was like, these lot went and cleaned it up afterwards. I don't know what it's like because like, I, I, I think I cleaned it up as good as I could. Huge thank you to Terry Ellis for sending Nathan our way. Nathan has served 18 years in prison. He's been through some brutal stuff as a young person. Usual trauma leading to crime that we see over and over, leading to drug addiction and crime that we see over and over that trajectory so many times with people. And his story actually starts out with him getting kidnapped by the Italian mafia in Reading. He's been in some of the most dangerous, violent prisons in the country. And we're just going to go through the whole life story. Huge thank you to Nathan for coming on. Huge thank you to Jen for co-hosting. As always. And thank you to Lindsay for, for minding Ziggy. <laughs> 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 and um, so Nathan, let's, let's just get straight into it then. I mean, yeah. how did it come that the Italian mafia were upset with you in the first place um, for this to happen? Uh, well, what it was, I was out of a... Um, group of my friends and uh, spotted a nice house and I thought it'd be funny to jump over the wall and um, I tried the patio doors and went in and uh, it was like a palace in there, you know, and it was like, I was only a young child and it was like a field day, like it was full of like exquisite goods and all that. And um, I just invited my mates in and we took a lot, you know. And uh, what happened at the time, because um, there was this was like in the 1980s, um, there was a pair of gold Moschino glasses and um, I sold them for a lump of dope to somebody. And um, that person got spotted with the glasses and um, he told them that he got them from me. So I was giving phone calls telling my mum that they went to my mum's with a gun and a knife looking for me. They went to my dad's looking for me kidnapped my mum's girlfriend and put her in the boot of a car. And in the end, um, I thought I'd better just go and speak to my dad. But my dad's a man of moral honour and compass in that kind of fraternity. And um, he'd had enough of what I was doing, you know, and he said, right, I'm going to teach you a lesson, you know, and he took me to him, you know. And um, I was bundled into the back of a car in front of all of my friends. So when you say he took you to him, Slow it down a bit. How did, how did that come about? Um, obviously, they'd been to his house and they'd been looking for me and like searched the house. And he said, right, I'm going to go and look for him. And he come and found me where I was, you know. And he said, get in the car, you little, you know, excuse my language. like, But um, yeah, he said, right, you've messed up this time, mate. He said, I'm fed up with people keep knocking my door looking for you. He said, uh, you're going to be taught today. And um he took me to him and... Uh, How were you feeling at that point? I was shitting myself. I had a big sword on me at the time. I wish I'd have took it with me, but I slipped the sword under my dad's car and um, 
I had a gun put to my head straight away. I admit it, I pissed myself. Like, I was only a 14-year-old kid, like, I'm afraid to admit it. And uh, I was driven about 30 miles to um, an orchard in the middle of Digcot. And um, I was told they were going to kill me, you know, and they, they started beating me brutally with a billy baton club. And How many of them were there? What did they look um, like? There was, it was three of them. Um, the main guy, I'm not, not, not going to name, he's quite high up in... Um, the fraternity and he told me that I'd done it wrong and I'd actually burgled his house on his birthday. That's why all the stuff was in the shopping bags and like I'd really messed up. And not only had I done him a wrong, I'd scared his missus and kids that didn't want to go back to the house. And he was beating me and beating me and they had a little shovel and they were going to make me dig my own grave, you know? And um, What went through your head at that point? You must have thought you were going to die. Obviously. Yeah, I did. I, well, I thought I was going to die. I, where I wasn't at the rural area, like, I was scared. I was a kid, you know, but I was there. was like, where's the stuff? Tell me who is with and all that. I said, I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not telling you. Like, if you, and then I don't know, saying like, I got beat so much. I had welt marks all across my body, like shapes of truncheon, you know, like that's how badly I was being beaten. And I don't know. I just said, look, if you kill me, you're never going to get your stuff back. Please stop, like, I'm begging for my life. I said, please, look, let, I said, let me, I'll, if, and I, I did get a bit cheeky at the time. I said, like, but then the beatings got worse, you know, and I said, look, if you tell, if you let me tell you where this, I'll get all your stuff back. I'm not willing to tell you who I was with, like, but I'll get you your stuff back, please, man. And he was telling me, you don't know what you've done to my missus and kids. They're so scared they won't even go. I said, please, like, please, I'm begging, like, let me, like, make it right. Please, I beg you. And I don't know what happened, but saying it stopped, the beating stopped. And I think they showed me a bit of compassion, you know, and they were like, right, can you get the stuff back? Where is it? I've got the stuff back. And they... Well, how did you get the stuff back? Because I knew where it was all stashed. Like, we'd stashed a lot of the stuff. Some of the stuff had been sold, which I knew I had to go and get back from the people that it had been sold to. But I gave them my word, and I did put it right. You know what I mean? And that guy, they then took me to his wife's house, put me on the toilet in front of his wife, and they cleaned me up because I was in a bad way. And... um I said, look, I'm sorry. And I, I, she said, why did you do this, the woman? I'm not going to name her, but um, she said, why did you do this? And I told her, I said, listen, I, this is what I do. I didn't know it was your house. I promise you it wasn't a target. Nobody else is going to do this to you because, like, she was scared. And she showed me compassion. She was like, look, I, if you, we'll help you. We'll get you a job. She had a salon and all that. She was like, you can come and do normal work. You need to live a normal life. And like I kind of like built a like little rapport with them that day, and that was thirty-two years ago. I'm still friends with those people now from that, you know. I think that's super impressive that the woman took so much compassion. She was offering you a job after you robbed their home. Yeah, I know it's mad. Like, and I like it's mad. I'm still I still talk to these people now. You know what I mean? I've been around them a lot in the past, and like, yeah, it's, it was quite mad. But I did. I was going to die that day. You know what I mean? But. I don't know why they stopped, you know, like, but I think it's just being like a bit ballsy. I don't know. I was pleading for my life, you know what I mean? Like, and and did managed. they catch any of your friends who were involved? Yeah, afterwards, as they pulled up, they caught my other mate and um, they kneecapped him, you know what I mean? And broke his arm and fractured his skull because they knew that he was with me when the glasses were sold, you know? Wow. So we're going to go back now, Nathan, to your life as it began to what led up to this and the, what comes after it. Yeah. So where were you born? Uh, I was born in Reading in Berkshire. Um, I was born on the D Road estate. Um, I was born in the late seventies. So I was the early eighties was like hard times. I was in um, a dysfunctional family, you know, like there was a lot of abuse, physical, mental, like abuse that I witnessed and I suffered and I was, kind of told not to tell no one what was going on in the house or not speak to the police or authorities or like and um sorry you were witnessing it in the house who was yeah but uh, my father my father was a like abusive person you know like towards my mother you know what sort of things would you witness horrific violent stuff yeah like some bad stuff like yeah a child shouldn't be seeing you know 
Was he uh, on alcohol and stuff or was it um, just anger it's problem? It's like, um, it's a gambling addiction, you know, like, and um, it, was, it was quite horrific with some of the stuff that I had to go through, you know, like, and witness. And I, and I ran away, you know, I used to run away from home because I didn't want to see that stuff. And all the people that I was told to stay away from, I was, I went around. I, I never was showed love and affection, like, um, and I went around the wrong crowd and like, I was pushed into the wrong kind of life, you know, I suffered like from that, like at the time I was only young, I didn't know what it was. Um, I was like groomed and manipulated, exploited by somebody that I trusted and I confided in, I was close to. And um, some quite horrific stuff happened to me as a young child, you know. How many siblings did you have? Um, I had two sisters. One was, um, uh, she's two years younger than me. Um, my other sister is with me today. She was a baby at the time, like, so I don't think she remembers none of that stuff, you know, but like, I was, I was, I was running away from that environment, you know? So you couldn't settle in school? No, I was excluded from school, I had behavioral problems, like, um, very angry, like, that's all I knew, you know, like that's all I'd seen was anger and that's the way I was, you know. I thought that was a normal way of life for me, you know, like, and I projected that onto other people, you know. Yeah. So how did you meet the person who groomed you? Um, at the swimming pool, like, because I used to go swimming and um, that's what I used to do. And my dad and mum used to give me a bit of money. I went to swimming and this person, he showed me like, affection that he cared and took me to football matches and bought me track suits and things like that and then um gave me alcohol and then done bad things to me you know but at the time i didn't know that it was bad i thought that was normal i was a kid i'd never had love i'd never had no one show me no care or nothing like that it was like and how old were you at that point i was about 11 years old oh then. my god oh, that's disgusting yeah. So you were introduced to alcohol at that age as well. Yeah, and cannabis and um, right. other recreational drugs as well, yeah. So we're going to call the drugs for this interview green, um, white and brown. Yeah. Rather than say the drug names. Yeah, okay, it, yeah. It's, it's better. Um, all right, so we, you were introduced to alcohol and green at age 11. Yeah. And how did those make you feel? Um, I felt that. I had a cloud over me, a, a shield, you know, it, it, it gave me a little bit of a shield, you know, it made me feel like I could cope with things and I'd escape him from the reality that I was being forced to live in, you know, like it just made everything feel nice, you know. Self-medication. Yeah. And then that, that graduated into crime. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I did at the time I was like, I was made to feel that, I was nicking off this person, you know what I mean? He had quite a lot of money and he used to let me count his money and stuff like that. And I was nicking fives and filling my socks with pound coins. And like, he knew about it, you know what I mean? And he's like, right, if you tell anybody else what's going on, like, I'm gonna get you done like by the police, you know? And then after that, I had some other horrific stuff happen. Shortly after I won a, a scholarship for a football academy um, with Bobby Charlton's soccer training school. And, um, I was quite a budding football player. I was dead in, really into football. And um, one day in the match, um, I got a leg stinger like, and I was sent to the changing rooms. And um, a guy called, I don't know if I can name him. like. No, let's keep names out. Yeah, but um, somebody, I went to the changing room to get assistance and I suffered um, some abuse there. And I went and spoke to the person that was running the academy is quite a high, very high profile football manager for Liverpool at the time he was. And um, I told him, look, that, that guy's just done this to me and Jamie, like, he's a, he's a, he's a sex case, you know, like I did, I call him sex case, sex case, hang him, hang him, hang him. And then because I spoke out about it, he said, if you ever say anything like that again, you'll never play football again. You, Cause there was a lot of scouts there, you know, for good teams, like a few of my mates went on to play for professional teams from that. And, um, the next day I went back to the academy and they made me pick up cones. They wouldn't let me play, you know? They made me go around the water log pick and pick up cones to me and the other guy that stuff happened to her. So, uh, so it happened to another guy as well at the same yeah, time? Yeah, at the same time, yeah. 
and they made you they punished you and made you pick up yeah, coins. Yeah, go and pick up all the all the all the football cones all around the pitches because there was loads of different um games like going on and you were being picked from that team and sent to that team. I was told I'd never play football again, so I thought, you know what, F you. I went back the next day, um, because I ran off from there, you know, after what happened, I got my bike back and I saw the guy's car. So um I said to my pal, you know what? I'm gonna rob the car. So I robbed the car and I took uh, this professional man's wallet and um there was a locket in there, what belonged to his mother and a check and some money like and um I ran off, but the caretaker saw me because he knew I was the guy who went for the bike what I'd left yesterday. And um the police turned up at my nan's house looking for me and um I said to him, Look, the only reason I did that is because what they done to me yesterday. But they were more interested in getting the goods back from what hap what I took than what happened to me. I spoke out then and nothing was done about it. Because I was a delinquent child, I wasn't taken seriously. And like from that, speaking out to the services, because I was in contact with the social services and the probation youth offending team, like I reached out to them and told them what happened and nobody helped me. So I just had a blatant disregard for authority from that moment on. And I thought, right, that's it. I just went on a crime rampage. I was hurting people, like say, experimenting more drugs, running away from home and like, um, doing some real crazy stuff. The police turning up at my house, looking for me every day. My mum telling them where I was. Started messing about with firearms at a young age, like 13 years old, was introduced to somebody who was involved in that. And um, I've, one day I thought it'd be funny to go and rob the local petrol station. And um, I went in there without a mask on and I robbed the petrol station. And the manager said, Nathan, why are you doing this, man? Like, But I still done it, still took the money, ran off. I didn't care at the time. I was in the care authority, then the local authority. And I didn't think nothing of it. Um, I ran back to the children's home and spent a bit of the money, hid the firearm. Um, I didn't think nothing of it until the next day when I woke up, it was five in the morning with a tactical SO19 team in searching the children's home, you know, and like, I thought it was funny, you know, like I was led away in a cable tie, like knowing that I'd spent the money and the, the, the firearm was gone. And um, there I was taken to the police station, but, because I was in the care of local authority, I was bailed and I went back to the place and was kind of like a bit of a celebrity and I like showing off and I just carried on doing what I was doing, you know, until I was um, back up in court and I was sentenced um, to a Feltham Young Offenders Institution, I think it's 1992, like I've never done that. Like, and in the back of the van on the way there, the police were taunting me saying, yeah, you think you're a big man running around with guns, scaring people. Wait till you see what's in store for you in the next five minutes. And I shit in my pants. Like I was with another male. I, I did, I admit, I cried, yeah, because I was scared, you know, and I I was in, walked into a reception and um, yeah, I, after three days, I got into a fight, went on a visit with a black eye. And I thought, and my dad told me, listen, get back to that wing and don't go and see them people again. Don't let them beat you. Like, and so I just grew um, to have no fear after that. And I started to like manipulate um, the environment to my advantage, you know, um, quite, quite good with words and that. And um, I started getting drugs in and corrupting staff and managing to blag them to get home visits so I could go and pick stuff up and take it back to the prison. How else would you get the drugs in? Um, I'll get some off staff sometimes or, or like support workers, um, but like send people out that were working on like out days out and stuff like that and arrange to meet people. It was relatively easy. Easy, yeah, it was, yeah. Mm. That first fight, Nathan, what was it over? Uh, well, I went to the gym with a pair of headphones on. I remember it clearly. Um, I went to the gym with a pair of headphones on. He had, had, had the orange foam on them. And a the guy said to me, let me have them earphones. And I said, no way, mate. I looked like Sony Walkman. You know, I was privileged to have that. In them days, you didn't used to have a lot. And I said, no way. And like, he said, right, get in the showers. And I didn't, what do you mean get in the showers? So I went to the showers. I ended up having a fight with him. You know what I mean? 
his brother was the gym orderly. He come in and filled me in as well. Like, so like, but you know, I didn't back down. I still fighted and the staff came and they broke it up. And on the way back, I got talking to them two guys and they were like, you know what? Yeah, for a country boy, because that's what they used to call me country boy. For a country boy, you're quite tough, you know? So yeah, it was like, but I went, I had to go on a visit three days after with a big black eye, you know, like, and um, my dad said to me, listen, don't back down, yeah? Anyone hits you, you either do them with your fist. And, but at that time, actually, he said, don't use your fist, use a tool. Don't get your hands dirty, you know what I mean? So, so I started getting into, like, using weapons and what, PP9 batteries in socks and pillowcases and bed, bed legs and all that, you know? What was the first situation that caused you to have to use a weapon? Um, somebody came in my cell, I was on a wing, like it was quite a rough wing and someone come in, because I was, I was, I, if you're under 16, you can't buy tobacco, but like I said, I used to manipulate the situation so I could get whatever I want. And a couple of guys came in and tried to take what I had, you know? So, um, I went back to my cell, got the PP9 back, we put it in a pillowcase and I went and filled them both in, you know? Um, did they back down after that then? Yeah, I didn't get no more trouble on that wing, no. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you did on another. No, not really. No, yeah, no? well, no. Like, sometimes you do, yeah, because it's all connected. Like, I've had conflicts what's followed me, you know, like, because I've done bad things. Like, I have had repercussions from the stuff what I've done, you know what I mean? I've had people come in and, like, I've been beaten up a few times. Like, I'm not afraid to admit it, but, like, when you're fighting gangs and things like that, you can't do nothing, you know? Just ongoing. So how long was that first sentence in uh, Felton, was it? It was only, um, it was like, because them times it was like detained sentence, only a few months, you know, because I was only a young offender, you know. But that didn't deter me, you know, like when I came out, I was Jack the Lad. I had more boost in my, like spring in my socks, you know, like, like I just, I don't know, just carried on from that. Is that in Reading? You went back to Reading? Yeah, back straight back to where I came from, yeah. And what kind of hustles are you doing? Um, robbing like quick save cash rooms, kicking off like when they're doing count ups and all that, like post offices when they're loading the vans and stuff like that. So would you sit outside these establishments and watch for when they were going to do these things? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I knew the days that they were coming, the times that they were coming. I'm quite like I'm quite educated. Like I used to like do research into it, but some of the stuff was spur of the moment, you know, like just on a hype, you know. And would you go in with a gun? Yes, most of the time, yeah. Either a gun or, or an axe or a hatchet on his stuff, yeah. Were you always alone or did you have a crew? In those days, there was three or four of us in a crew, yeah, but like I did go on to do what I normally started doing because there's a few of them like grasped me up and things like that. And like, so I started doing things on my own. Like my dad told me, listen, if you're going to do something, don't do it with no one else, you know, like you can't grasp yourself up, can you? What situations arose that they ended up grassing you up? Um, the guy that I'd done the petrol station with, um, he told the old Bill it was me. That's why they turned up at the care home looking for me, you know? So they arrested him and then he grassed on you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's Great like my, my last sentence when I got the IPP. I didn't even do this robbery, yeah? Someone owed me money and um, I made him, I told him you better get my money and... Um, yeah, I, I did smash the window and then um, he, he, he said I forced him in to commit a robbery in order to pay a drug debt. So he, did, he got a public immunity and I got an IPP, but that's like, you know, that's what happened, you know. How old were you then? Um, I was 28 when I got my IPP, you know, for that, for that robbery. Um, at the time, um, I was on remand and still a joke to me you know what i mean but by then like i progressed into using white and dark and like my drug use had completely spiraled out of control you know and let's stop you there a minute Nathan, because we yeah. need to go back yeah. yeah all right so you get out of feltham yeah how long was your spree for the next 16 years okay but until your next sentence yeah i used to get little sentences three months six months 12 months a year just progress like as got longer as it went on you know what were the major things that happened during the early years of that spree yeah a lot of violence and aggression and um a lot of mad times in jail you know what i mean a lot of low times as well you know like i did a 
I did. I had a lot of, when I come off the of drugs and that, I used to be get really depressed, you know, like, and I've attempted suicide on a few occasions, you know, like trying to cry out for help. I was a lost soul, you know, like, I didn't like know how to cope with emotions, you know, like, that was when I come off the of drugs, I was faced with reality, you know. So, Is this in your late teens? Yeah, from my late teens, and yeah. So you contemplated in your life in your late teens? Yeah, I did, yeah. What brought you to that first point? Um, like I was in, I was in Feltham again, and um, got into an argument. And like I said, they're gonna. I done some. I had a fight in the showers, and they said they were gonna do me like quite a lot, large group of individuals, like in a little team. And what was the beef over? Um, just over a game of pool that was. And like my mate, one the officer twisted my mate's ear, and like my mate had a fight with them, and like they come onto me because I was a little weak white boy, you know, like. And they're all like in um ethnic gang, you know, like and um they told me they're gonna cut me up in the morning, you know, like you better get off the wing and like I didn't want to run off the wing, you know what I mean? But I did put a noose around my neck, you know, and, and I pushed the buzzer, you know, like it was a cry for help, you know. How, how what was going through your head at that moment? How did I just didn't want to die in the morning, you know what I mean? Because I'd already been through all that stuff with the people, like, it kind of, like, put, took me back to that situation. I'm thinking, now I'm in trouble here, like, what am I going to do about this, you know? And so when you ran the buzzer, obviously the screws run in. Yeah. And you got the noose around your yeah, neck. Yeah, and I jumped off the thing, you know what I mean? They cut me down and that, you know what I mean? Oh my God. I jumped off the chair, you know? What's the aftercare then? Um, Like... They kept me banged up for a couple of days and I kept coming to myself, sat outside myself for a while. And like, people said like, look, it weren't that bad. Like, you know, like you didn't have to do that. Like I didn't get no trouble after them, off them people after that. Kind of went all right back on the wing then. It was all right, you know? So they didn't try to go at no, you again No, they didn't get onto me, you know what I mean? I was like, you know, did, like it was all right. I don't know, it kind of like changed. I started getting on with them people after that, you know what I mean? I'd say I'd rather die than getting any more trouble, you know what I mean? Or hurt anybody. I didn't want to hurt anybody again, you know what I mean? When did that sentence end? Um, that was in about... Um, I think about 1996, 1997, yeah. So how old were you then, early 20s? Yeah, getting, yeah, I was about, yeah, about just coming up to my 20s, yeah. And well, wow, back to Reading? Yeah, and then I was sent to the, I was, because of my behaviour in um, Reading Prison, like, keep fighting, I was in Aylesbury, like, and... Um, what, was the, what were those fights over? Stupidness, pettiness, like me thinking I'm Jack the Lad on the wing, you know, like trying to like and just like clash of personalities. It's just like a hostile environment in there, like everyone's boosting them, trying to feed their own ego, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I got into a lot of conf conflicts, you know what I mean? But I've got, I, I'd, I'd built myself a reputation as like one of those people who could look after themselves, and um, I didn't really like take or suffer fools, you know what I mean? So few people used to get get on to me about it but nothing serious never happened you know what i mean i had a few serious incidents but it sounds like obviously you've spent most of your teens and 20s yeah. in and out of prison did yeah. at any point you want to go straight uh well yeah like i've had opportunities like when my dad or my dad's friends like family friends have tried to help me you know like um give me opportunities for work and all that but I used, to, I used to think to myself, like, I'm working for £200 a week here. I can go and get that in five minutes. Like, I didn't I didn't appreciate, like, the doing that. Like, even though I enjoyed the working and that, I liked the physical side of it, but, like, I liked quick money, you know what I mean? So what else were the major things that happened to you in your early 20s? Um, like, uh, when I was in my early 20s, I was in, um, I, like, a relationship with my ex-partner and we had a child and um like it was a dysfunctional relationship like we we're both physically and verbally and mentally abusive to each other and it was a chaotic dysfunctional relationship you know what i mean and I, and I got into conflict with these people and i had to leave you know what i mean i, I ran away i ran away because i didn't know how to love how to be i didn't like, I didn't have that responsibility in me, you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, and that broke down, man. And I just went off and started getting onto the hard drugs. And that's when I was introduced to the white and the dark and that, you know? How did that make you feel? Invincible.
maybe for Invincible, like I could take the world on and that's when things like got worse, you know, I didn't care about, I was doing a lot more like erratic stuff when like people knew it was me, but I didn't care because I was desperate and I needed to get like my fix, you know. So did the criminality escalate at that point? Yeah, it escalated into, uh, instead of just going around having little sniffs around to see what I could find lying around, I used to start, I started doing a lot more robberies and like planned stuff, you know, like just to get, try and get as large rewards as I could, you know. Now doing these robberies, did you ever feel guilty? No, not at the time, no, but I do now. I've got compassion. I didn't have no I didn't have no emotions then. I like the only the only emotions I knew, yeah, at that time was anger, hurt and fear. Like that was all I had, you know, but I didn't fear nothing, but at certain times I did, you know. But that was the that was the only emotions that I had. I didn't know how to regulate my emotions because I'd never had them, I've never been given them. I'd like it was hard for me to regulate that, you know. During these robberies, did anything go wrong? Did anyone like come home unexpected? Yeah, a few times, yeah. I've got into fights and stuff with people, yeah. Like I've, I've been locked in places and given beatings a couple of times. So yeah. they like physically locked you in? Yeah, I got caught. I got caught in a grow house once by the Chinese and they like, they give me a few like beatings, like with a rolling pin, stabbed me in the leg with a screwdriver. Hold on, slow down, slow down. <laughs> yeah. Right, how did you know about this was a grow house? How did you get the information? I just see like a few people coming and going like, and I said to my pal, there's something not right in that house. And I thought he was a DVD man, you know? Like, cause he's like, he was the DVD man. And like, he got a whiff in the street. Yeah, and I like, I, <laughs> I thought, you know, something is not right in that house. So I got a ladder. Like my dad was living just over the back of it as well. So I used to see people coming and going from this place. I said to my pal, there's something going on in that house. So I got a ladder at the next door neighbor's garden. I put it up to the thing and that's when I fucking smelt the grow, you know what I mean? So I was in there, we were bagging it all up, putting it in quilt, you know, in quilt covers, yeah? And they come back, you know what I mean? And there was only one way out, the front door, what they were coming through. And they got me, you know. How what I mean? many of them? There's like four of them, you know. What like I mean? Chinese mafia. Or something. Yeah, like they were like 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 kind of like triads or something. But they were mad. Like they got me, beat me with a rolling pin, they hit me with pans, stabbed me in the leg with a screwdriver. My mate managed to get out, you know what I mean, and get on the bus and go. But I didn't, you know what I mean. Like I got, yeah, it was quite mad, you know what I mean. But I still managed to get a one suit, one pillowcase full of. That I put in the alley, so I was chuffed. Even though I got caught and got a beat, and I still got a reward. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> any, any other scrapes like that? Um, trying to think around that time. Yeah, like Robin, like one of my dad's mates. Like, why did you choose him? I, don't know, I just I knew what he was up to and that. And um, what do you mean by that? He used to sell like women and cats and all that. So I waited for him to go to the pub where I knew he used to go every time on a Saturday afternoon and I went and done the yard and they knew it was me because I went inside and the woman was in there and I, and I managed to creep upstairs and I got all the and a load of kids, about 400 quid, that was a lot of money then, yeah. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I've got some exciting news to announce. Michael Francis is coming back to tour the UK in 2024. The Remade Man Tour, The Michael Francis Story. Michael Francis, once named one of the 50 most significant mob bosses in the USA by Fortune magazine, and a former member of the notorious Colombo crime family, will take you deep into the world of organized crime, sharing captivating tales and insights into the Mafia's past, present, and future. Join us for an unforgettable evening with Michael Francis, the original Goodfella, as he exclusively sits down with myself, Sean Atwood. With me as the host, there's going to be a no-holes-barred exploration of Michael Francis's life, including his numerous arrests and jury trials that ultimately led to his pleading guilty to a federal racketeering charge, a 10-year prison sentence, and $15 million in restitution. You will have the unique opportunity to ask questions during an audience Q&A session, making this event a must-see for true crime enthusiasts and anyone curious about the underworld. Don't miss this explosive, 
in conversation with Michael Francis. Live on stage in the UK, this exclusive in-person event will be held in various locations in the UK, Ireland and Scotland. Link in the description box below this video if you want to grab yourself a ticket. Back to the podcast. Cheers. And I went down downstairs and a woman see me and I run. So a mate called my dad out and said, right, your son's just robbed my house. You know what I mean? But my dad hates drugs, yeah? Like, he didn't care about the drugs. He wanted some of the money, you know, because of his addiction. Like, so that's, like, I didn't get in no trouble for it. Like, Let's pay your dad off. Yeah, you know, I'll just give him a bit of money, yeah. <laughs> mm. And what was your next arrest? Um, my next arrest was, like, um, after that, I got done for an aggravated burglary. Like, I broke into somewhere and I fell asleep, like, because I was out of my head. And they locked me in and like, I had a candle burn and that's why it was aggravated burglary. Like, cause I, <laughs> Wait, sorry, where did you fall asleep? Not in the bathtub, was it? No, it, on, in, in the living room. Like, I fell asleep, yeah. And I got caught like, in the so place. So they locked you in? Yeah, they locked all the doors. So, so you woke up to what? To the old boo everywhere. And I didn't have no shoes on or nothing. Like, Because I was walking around homeless, my feet were white, you know what I mean? And I broke into this place and I fell asleep, you know what I mean? Did you did you lie down intending to go to sleep? No, I didn't know, but I was so like emotionally exhausted. I don't know. I just sat down and I was trying to get into this drawer, and like, I just flaked That's out. That. Yeah, I flaked out. Yeah. So what was your charge? Aggravated burglary. Yeah, I got aggravated. That was for aggravated burglary because the aggravated features because there's people in the house. But not only that, but I'd had one of those twenty four hour candles burning. I left it burning in the room, so that was the aggravating feature by putting other people at risk. So what was got, your sentence? I uh, got three year, four month for that. Which prison? Um, in Bullingdon, yeah. What was that like? I had some madness then as well. Somebody robbed my tobacco and I'd done him with a jam jar. I found out who he was. Just come off an anger management course, gone back to my cell. Where's my backy? Like my mate Aaron, who I was banged up with, he's like, oh, that black guy took it. So I was like, are you taking a piss? I got two jam jars in, in a sock and I went and found him, done him in the showers with um, the jam jars, kicked him all up and down, he was naked. He'd come out and like running out like a couple of minutes later, I jumped on me, we folded ourselves up in the table tennis table. You know, like when you lean on them table tennis tables and then got took to the block. But I was more interested in getting rid of the stack of phone cards that I had, do you know what I mean? Because it's that currency. And I, like, I'm even, I've even made friends with that guy as well after that. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I see him on a train a few years later coming from Oxford. I was like, you, he's like, it's mad. Like that happened, but like move forward from it, innit? Which prison was that? That was in Bullingdon, yeah. Went on that sentence, what I'm talking about now. This is the aggravated burglary one. Yeah. How yeah. long was that sentence? Three year, four months. That was my longest sentence that, that come, do you know what I mean? Because of the aggravated features, you know what I mean? And then after that, like, um, I got out and like, I don't know what happened. I just got back on the drugs and that. I was in another relationship, what broke down. I got a flat and then um, I took some heroin that was contaminated with rohypnol and ended up going on a mad crime spree. And um, that's when this robbery stuff happened. I don't even remember, I, like I woke up in the police station. I never got out. And um, what was the robbery spree that you did? Um, just robbing like all the dealers in like all around the area, Berkshire area. While like, they were home, or did you wait till they left? Yeah, I just going in there, yeah, taking all their bits. You know what I mean? I was going in there, buying bits off of them, and then um, building their trust. And I go back and I take a lot. You know what I mean? With with the brown getting contaminated with rohypnol. Yeah. How does that work? Well, I didn't know. I bought some. I bought some some brown off somebody and. Um, I took it and I was like, I feel weird. But then I don't know, I just, it was just a blackout. I woke up at a girl's house um, who lived above me. I was seeing her and um, I was like, she was like, what happened last night? She was like, I don't know, but you came back yeah, with a drawer full of um, um, Australian dollars, loads of euros, all these mobile phones, chains and bracelets, yeah? So I phoned a dealer, um, cause my mate was clucking downstairs, yeah? Uh, and um, he came and then like obviously the woman that she he was with I told him what I'd done last night and then next minute later I had the armed um, feds there like and they led me away you know like to the police station and um, then I had to go I, 
I still don't remember exactly what happened that day, but I told them that I, I don't remember what happened. All I remember is taking some of this stuff. So they took the stuff and they found like quite a bit of it, a quarter of it in my house. And they te- my solicitor got it tested and it was contaminated with benzodiazepine and a laundry pin. Like that's what it was cu- cut with, you know, and that's what led me to end up getting the uh, IPP sentence. Well, I didn't know, I didn't take it seriously until one day off, so Miss D came to me and she said, right, Brooksy, you need to come out of your cell. Like, this is serious, like, you need to come to the office. I was like, right, what's going on? She's like, look, this is from the home office. Um, we've got to inform you that um, you're facing a life sentence. And I was like, what? What do you mean? It's only a robbery. Like, I've done loads of them. She was like, yeah, that's the thing. Because I had a attempted robbery in 1995 and an armed robbery in 1993 on the petrol station, what I said. I'm now in this third strike and you're out. And um, I just laughed it off, you know what I mean? I thought, yeah, I'm getting a life sentence. I didn't take it seriously because nobody knew about this new sentence what had come out. It was um, called the IPP, um, uh, Indeterminate Public Protection. Right? And because of the escalation in my crime and... Um, was now posing a significant risk to the public. Um, yeah, like, you're going to get a long time. But I still didn't take it seriously. Still, still messing about on the wing until I went up to the court in Reading and um, the judge, like, she said, listen, I'm imposing a sentence of public protection. What tariff is that? Four years, you're due eligible for parole at two years. Um, until you demonstrate you're no longer a risk to the public, you remain confined into prison. And um, I got that sentence. And I admit, I went downstairs with another man who just got the same sentence, my mate called Des. Like, and um, we, I cried about it because I didn't know it was new then. Even the staff in the cells, they didn't know what it was, you know. And I was led away and I went back to the jail and spoke to my family. I like, spoke to my mum and I said, look, I've got life. And like, she was like, what? Like, I spoke to my sister, I've got life. Like, and I was, do you know what? I thought, I thought, F you, you know what? I'll show you dangerous now. And I went on to start playing up and getting into a lot of fights with staff um, to the point that they said, listen, we can no longer control you in this prison. Like, now you're going to Parkhurst, to a big boys jail, you know? Can you describe arriving at Parkhurst your first day? Well, that day, they come to me at five in the morning to my cell. I said, pack your kit, Booksy. You're going to the Isle of what? I was like, what? I said, no, nah, I ain't, mate. Like, I'm staying here. Like They were like, you can do it the hard way or the easy way. And I'd done it the hard way. I went bundled up with leg straps and handcuffs until I got on a ferry and they took them off. You know what I mean? Like, And then I went to Parkhurst and that is a very, very, very cold there's no atmosphere on the wing it's a cold solid environment you know and i've come into contact with some proper like high profile bad bad it's full of murderers and killers and like serious serious offenders like my stuff is play school compared to that you know like and it was a mad time there yeah a very mad time i witnessed some horrific stuff like there like people getting melted with hot oil, you know, their faces getting melted off. And, Jugged. Yeah, like, well, it was cooking facilities and one day I'd gone into the kitchen. I've, I've witnessed that twice, once in Parkhurst, once in Swellside. Someone had a, uh, a, uh, a guy from a different ethnic background, he was getting into an argument with another guy and he boiled up loads of butters, put them in a, in a saucepan and he threw it over him. Like and melted his face. Like Do you see, literally the skin melting yeah. down them. The second time when I saw it, yeah, it was like it was like you know, like saying what you see in a cartoon, like yeah, like a mold being just like disintegrating, like down the fa- yeah, it was mad. And a guy put a bit of that blue kitchen towel on his face. And oh his no! Nose, his nose came off in his hand. Oh. I promise you, like it come off in his hand. Oh. Like, and I've never heard a scream like that in my life imagine yeah you said there was famous killers any f- ones that we've heard in the news uh, yeah I, was, I got quite friendly with a guy you know he, he killed his mum and um put her in a suitcase and then got caught in time in times square in america 
Do you remember that? Yeah, he what was, song was that? I can't remember his name, but like, um, yeah, he, he killed his mum, put her in a suitcase. There's another guy there who cooked his mum. Like, there's some mad, mad- Cooked like, his mum? Yeah, there was, like he was a cannibal, yeah. Stan the Cannibal, he was called, yeah. But like, you don't hear about these people who have done these crimes until you're in that environment. And that's like, that was like, what? Like, you know, like, it was mad, like, because it's proper opened your eyes, you know what I mean? Were you in a cell on your own now? Yeah, it's all, all single cells there, yeah. Well, once I was in a cell, but my mate got robbed for his phone and I went and got it back for him. And I got into a bit of conflict with a couple of high profile um, gangsters from Manchester, but I managed to get it back. And then I fell out of my cell, mate. I ended up headbutting him. And like, so then they put me as high risk, you know what I mean? Because I said, I'm not fighting your battles no more, mate. Like you've been robbed twice, I've got it back twice. You're not, I'm not doing it no more. Get away from me, you fool, you know what I mean? So these fellas who had killed their mothers, did they tell you the reasons why? Yeah, one of that guy, that, the cannibal guy, like he was just, um, he was drinking methylated spirits and all that and taking LSD and he thought that his mum was possessed and that. So he killed her and cooked her, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Did he say like about eating her? Yeah, because he was neglected as a kid and he never had no food. He wanted to teach her a lesson. Yeah, it's mad. Like, it seems mad me saying that. Why like, do you think I ever feed Ziggy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's big. Yeah. He's going to eat oh you soon. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's mad. Like, you meet some some mad people in there. Like, there's, it's like mad. It was a culture, bit of a culture shock. But so I had to kind of remob myself to be a certain way in there. Like, even though I still had my, like, bravado and, like, the way I carry myself, like, I was a lot more like subdued there, you know, like because there's a lot of bigger things going on than me, you know what I mean? The one who put his mum in the suitcase, did he tell you why he did yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know why he done it. He killed his mum, yeah, and like he tried to get away, like because his dad died something to do with his inheritance, and his mum and his brother wouldn't give him no money because he was um he'd been in a psychiatric unit and like he killed her and then panicked and hid her body in a suitcase and like he fleed and he was found in Times Square. He told me somebody saw him on a bench, yeah, a member of the public was looking at the New York Times, yeah. He told me I got caught. Um, I was another geezer who killed his mum for piss because she pissed in his shoes as well. That was one of my friends, yeah. Pissed in his shoes? Yeah, like my mate, he's from my area. I ain't going to mention his name, but his mum, his, 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 his stepmum was an alcoholic. My sister, I probably know who I'm talking about, but yeah, his mum, stepmom was an alcoholic and she was being abusive to my friend. Um, and um, so he come home from the pub on a Friday night one day, he said, and she and she pissed in his shoes. So he, he bludgeoned her to death, you know, oh and, and killed her and left her. But he did phone the ambulance, so he didn't get quite a long time. He got like, a, I think like a 16 year tariff or something because it was a domestic homicide, like, yeah, so he was one of my mates, yeah. You were in the process of telling um, us how the suitcase mum killer got caught. Oh, yeah, he said he said to me that he was in Times Square. He didn't know. He couldn't stay in his area. I think he was from, like, Dorset area. So he got out, got on a ferry, went to Ireland. From Ireland, he went to America, yeah? And um, he was in Times Square, like, just minding his own business, trying to keep out of England. And he said if it, it, somebody in, was reading the New York Times and it was about the crimes, like European crimes and all that, and somebody spotted him and uh, some police on a horseback came and like surrounded him and he was arrested and taken, extradited back to England. You know what I mean? What was his sentence out of interest? I think got like a 32 year tariff, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think 26 dying. or 32, like, that's what I'm saying. In there, like, in the other jails, you get like people what I've got like six months, 12 months, three years, you're doing seven years, you're like your top dog or whatever. But these people are doing like multiple, multiple life sentences. You know what I mean? And that's the, I was having to live on the wing, like they're sociopaths. Like there's one guy like long hair, like they were grave diggers. I don't know if you heard about these guys, but there was, um, you know, that lady who tests on animals, monkeys and all that, Do you know, in Oxford, yeah? These, like there's a laboratory in Oxford and uh, is they, it for like makeup or something? Yeah, for like testing products. Like I don't know exactly what they do, but like they test their products on animals and that. And like this woman died, and they were like tree huggers, tree protesters, yeah, and like you know like activists, yeah. And they went and nicked the woman's body out the grave, and ransomed the laboratory in Oxford and said, right, if you don't stop 
Testing on animals, you'll never get the body back. And they was on the wing with me, like, you know what I mean? Were they all right? Yeah, they were white right. people. They're just like, if you see these people, like, they were like hippie people, like, but they, what they done, I was like, I spoke to them, why did you do that? They were like, listen, they don't care about what they're doing to the animals. So we thought we'd send a message, you know what I mean? They got done for like blackmail, bribery, and all that, you know? They were the grave diggers. I think they got like nine and a half years each. There's two of them, but proper strange guys, you know what I mean? What other high-profile cases were there? Um, there's like um, a few like serious gangbangers from Liverpool and Manchester, like they're quite, quite notorious. Um, Dominic Noonan was there, like was he? yeah, there was like yeah, was, was he? Sorry, Manchester. Yeah, he was there. Matt, Paul Massey was there. It was like a few like high-profile people on the wing, like but it was they were all right with us. You know what I mean? On a Saturday afternoon, we used to all go upstairs. Your officers, you never see the officers in them high security prisons. They're in a bubble, you know, like that. So on a Saturday, we used to go in the room upstairs. Uh, it's like a, there's a pool table, play dominoes. We take a couple of buckets, you know, like 10 litre buckets of proper distilled alcohol. That's when I saw proper distilled. And we'd go and sit and drink, have cups and games of pool and games of dominoes. And when it comes to five minutes before bang up, that's when you see the officers. But everyone used to bang up there, you know what I mean? You never, like, it's it's a different environment people are more like um you know like they stick to the regime and that you know what i mean it sounds like you didn't have as much trouble there even though you're surrounded by psychopaths once i had a little bit of trouble um i went on a visit with my sister and my mum like and it's hard to get visits there so like it's only a, even the parkers is a big establishment very hard to get visits and it's only a small visit room it's probably three times the size of this building here yeah and um i've gone on a visit my mum, my sisters, my stepdad were there and I was handing out some ceramic pottery that I used to make, you know, like door plaques and cards and like cards, you know, stuff what I've made. And there was somebody on the visit, a big um, big gangster from London, a young kid. He's only about 22, yeah, but he's about 17 stone. No, about se seven foot and about 22 stone. A big guy, they used to call him KO, yeah? And um, I walked back from the visit with him, normal, yeah? So anyway, I had to wear a stripy shirt and all that for your visits. Anyway, I, I was down on the twos landing. Next to me, I had Brooksy, yo. And like, no one really needs to go on the fours because that's where all the high profile people were up there, yeah? Yo, come upstairs, blood. I said, what, 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 what? So I got upstairs, you know what I mean? Right, where's the parcel? I was like, what do you mean, where's the parcel? They're like, we know, yeah, that you've got something on that visit, yeah? I was like, I was on a visit with my mum and my sisters, you know, like I've had a family visit. I probably, right, take your clothes off and squat, get on the toilet. I was like, what? Come on, please, mate. They fuck, plugged the line in. They're like, listen, if you don't give us the pack here, we're going to burn you. But my mate, Corey, who's on a visit as well, obviously he knew what was going on because one of the guys, Abs, told him they'd got Brooksy in the cell. And he come in and surrendered the parcel to him. Do you know what I mean? He said, look, I've got the pack. There was something like, you know, so that was quite a scary thing for me. You know what I mean? But like, I thought I was going to get either burnt with the iron or caved in. You know what I mean? So, it was so quite... the blo if he surrenders the parcel, isn't the blowback from that from the people who own the parcel? Well, the guy that I know, the geezer that owned the pack and he... He didn't surrender it all. He only gave him one ball, you know what I mean? So there was still other stuff there. But he'd rather that, the guy, my mate from Bristol, who, who'd set it up, like, he didn't care. But we were blessing them anyway. Like, when we used to get their bits, our bits, we used to go and see them and give them something, you know? So we never got no trouble. But I think they just got greedy that day and they wanted the whole thing, you know what I mean? What about serial killers? Yeah, there's quite a lot of serial killers in there, yeah. Who? Oh, I'm trying to, let me think now. Well, there's quite, a few, yeah, there's quite a few. I'm trying to think, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think, let me think. I don't know, there's quite a few in there. There's too many to name, like, the wing is just, like, full of, like, high-profile life sentence prisoners that have done the most horrific things in the world. Do you know what I mean? But some of these things you don't even hear about, like, that cannibal killer who ate his mum and that. You never hear about that in the newspapers, you know what I mean? You don't, like, it's it's weird, like, it, it's quite weird, yeah. Did you have friends in there? Yeah, I made some good friends in there that I'm still in contact with now, yeah, a couple of Manchester boys. Like, I've, I've, made, some, like, I've made some good links with, which have led on to me getting in trouble again, you know what I mean? Like, and I've bumped into them in other jails and 
like yeah i've met some i've made some like that's one thing about in prison some of the people that you're living with in there you're living with them 24 hours so you've got a better bond and a relationship than with them than you have with your family you know and did you have a job there yeah, I used to always get the best jobs. I don't know how, but I'd blag it. I'd be like the grounds orderly, recycling. Like I'd be out. Like I used to do stuff what I could get beneficial from, like picking up packs in the grounds. Like I, I was quite good at like blagging the screws and like I got. Well, what I do is I get the qualifications, and then I say, right, listen, I'm skilled to do this job. So I'd be a Samaritan or I'd be an emotional support mentor that give me traffic, like give me a passport to leisure. I used to call it, you know, like. You'd have your little band and you could go from wing to wing. And I used to get about like that, like I was living quite good in it, yeah. And is that how you got friendly with the corrupt screws? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Well, I had a good one in Swellside. Like after I was in Swellside, I was talking to an officer. He's quite kind and that. He used to always give us roll-ups. And I said, what, what's the matter with you one day? He said, oh, I'm really pissed off, mate. I should have realised. I said, what? He said, my mother-in-law... I went, to, took her to Specsavers to get a hearing test, he said, yeah. And um, I said, yeah. He said, now they're trying to bill me three and a half grand for the, for the hearing aid. I was like, really? I said, what ear is it? Because I've got damaged left ear, what somebody bit off, yeah. He said, I was my left ear. Um, he said, uh, I said, all right, leave that with me. So I went to the healthcare, done a bleep test. They took me out to Medway Hospital. I'd done another little test. And they gave me this little hearing aid, a Siemens one, a really good one. So I went up to him and said, mate, you're right, mate. I said, yeah, bam. He caught it in his hands. I said, what's that? I said, that's for your mother-in-law. From then on, like, he was like, right, I'm gonna have to start doing something proper for you, you know, like, um, I was like, nah, you're good to us anyway. Like, from then on, he's bringing me like three balls every week and three 50 grand pouches for about 16 months. Then I got into a bit of beef in that jail. Somebody tried to take my phone. They put me in a sleeper hold, dragged me in a cell trying to take my phone off me. And I got woke up by a screw called Tom. He's like, look, I don't know what's happened, but you need to get back to your cell. My cheekbone was all busted. And I thought, this, like, I'm, I'm making a tool. I made a big shank, like, and um, I stayed banged up for a couple of days. And I come out and, like, Richie, like, I was, and the, the officer that, um, that I was getting stuff off, I said, look, where's my snout and where's my um, thing? He's like, look, I'll, yeah, there's d but I'll bring you the tobacco later on. So I banged up at lunchtime and uh, he come about four o'clock. I was like, where have you been? He's like, you know what happened, yeah? Because they was trying to talk me into getting him, get him to bring phones in, yeah? But what I had with him was good enough, yeah? I was eating good, yeah? Like, um, and I said, no, I'm not asking him for that. So what they done, they dragged him in the cleaning cupboard and said, right, well, you not know, banged his head off the wall. He ended up leaving the job, you know what I mean? Because he, he was in the service. He already had post-traumatic stress and stuff. They got him in the cleaning cupboard, banged his head off the wall twice and said, if you don't do for us what you're doing for Brooksy, we're going to serve you up. And he ended up bringing me my bit of tobacco. And he said, right, that's it. He said, I'm going off sick. So like, yeah. That, and then How did so they find out he was bringing stuff in for you? Obviously, because I was swapping some of the stuff with a little team downstairs, yeah? And like, because I was smoking that spice at the time, yeah? I was swapping the weed for spice, yeah? Because the spice didn't come up in the piss test and I couldn't afford to get no piss test or I wouldn't get my parole. But, so that's what I was doing, but they just wanted it, all of it, you know what I mean? Like, so, that and they wanted they wanted to eat for themselves, innit, obviously, you know what I mean? Did you not go crazy on Spice? Yeah, I did. I, I can go on to that now. Like, I, I, I thought that I got so psychologically and mentally damaged at that time, yeah? I ended up being sectioned in the healthcare unit. Do you know what I mean? Like, I thought that the IRA were tunnelling in to kill me and, like, I, I, I went really mad and I ended up getting sectioned um, and put in the healthcare for my own safety. And they put me on some medication and I managed to get well. Like my sister, she came, she was coming through all my parole processes at that time. I was very ill, you know what I mean? But I didn't tell these like I was on Spice. I thought it was all real, you know, like what I was seeing, what I was hearing. And I thought the telly was talking to me and the subtitles, honest to God, I, they were telling me messages. Like I got very psychologically ill. And then what stopped me smoking that Spice is somebody said to me, if you take one cap, a whole lid, you know, like a Kiora lid. If you do that, I'll give you three caps. So me being Jack the Lad, 
I'd done it and I woke up in Medway Hospital with someone touching my penis, chained to a bed. And I woke up and I was like, what the f is going on, yeah? They were like, look, you code blue, you died. We had to give you, um, we had to give you a defibrillator. You like, you stopped breathing three times, and you were so severely dehydrated that we've had to put six liters of fluid into your body, and you haven't released it. So nobody's abusing you because I, I was like, what are you doing to me? Like, I had to to release the fluid. Putting you know? a catheter. Yeah, putting a catheter, and that's what they were doing. Yeah, but like I said, no, I'll go to the toilet. So he uncuffed me from the bed. Mum took me to the toilet and I said, right, I want to go back to the jail. And they're like, no, you're not going nowhere, mate. You've got to wait till tomorrow because you've got to see the, the, the ward, you know, the doctor. And I went back and a guy said to me, he showed me on a video, I was screaming like a dinosaur. <coughs> you know, I stopped breathing, yeah. Like, it was like, because I said, yeah, I told you I told you it, spudded him. And next minute, I don't remember, like, my first of all, my hearing went, then my sight went, and then I woke up in the hospital, you know, like, um, yeah, and I got back to the prison, and the geezer showed me the video. I said, look at that, mate. Like, my mate Bobbo, he's like, no, I was giving you the kiss of life. The officer was breathing, giving you the kiss of life. You know, like, it was mad. It was like, I don't know because men under this, but this is what they told me. And the geezer goes, yeah, there's your free caps, and I'll give you an extra one, like, because you sold it. And I said, I never want that stuff again, you know what I mean? And I haven't took it since, you know what I mean? I haven't took it since. And but it made me psychologically ill. I thought that anybody everyone's planning to kill me. Even my family, I like that they were working with the fucking police telling them what I was up to because I was getting on to my mum and my sisters, like, look, transfer that money to this account. I was doing hustles, you know, and like I was thinking they was working with the authorities and all that. It was it was a mad old time, you know. How did you come to think the IRA were tunneling in? in uh, well, it was yeah. It's because one of my family members, yeah, um, he was convicted for something to do with the IRA in the early eighties, and like we, were, I had to go to Canada when I was ten years old, yeah, during the trial because my family was at risk, yeah. And he didn't give no names. He he got a life sentence, and I'm done fifteen years for it, yeah. But because I was in Parkhurst with my, my my great cousin, and he told me loads of his secrets, yeah? I thought that they were coming to get me because I knew where certain things were. My head was gone. I don't know why I thought that, do you know what I mean? But I thought they were going to get me because of him, you know? Why did someone attempt to bite your ear off? Um, uh, what happened is uh, I was on a drink jug fraud bender. Um, this is like... A, this is like before I got my APP, I was in a drunk drink fuel bender and I was said to a guy, you all right, mate? Just walking in the flats with my daughter's daughter's mum. And he said, what do you say? He's quite an odd traveling gypsy fella. And he said, what do you say, mate? So I started having a straight with him and he bit my ear off, you know what I mean? Like there, it's quite bad. But um, I ended up going and getting big carving knives and it got into a madness. But then I got locked up. Yeah, I was, went into prison like Vincent van Gogh with a big bandage on my head. And they wanted they wanted to take the bit of ear off, yeah? But it had a secondary infection. It stunk like dead flesh. But it managed to grow back normal without them taking it off. Otherwise, I'd have, otherwise I'd have had a whole bit missing. Do you know what I mean? See it, yeah. Yeah, but like that guy, I, I said to him, why did you do that, much, Sam? Yeah, he's like, look, Sorry, I just because I've been with a guy all day, you know, like that, drinking, sniffing lines off of a bar in, in a pub in my area. Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast. It's a word from our sponsor, Shady Rays, and it is the season of giving. Get the perfect gift for that special somebody, yourself or both. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades and quick swap snow goggles that won't break the bank. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that offers an unrivaled product. That's just as good as any expensive pair we've worn. Durable frames and world-class optics for all outdoor adventures. And Jen's blonde locks aren't getting tangled. In the tangle-free nose piece, so I can put it up in my hair like this. <laughs> no catching. With an extensive array of styles and colours, you're bound to find the perfect pair of Shady Rays sunglasses. And if you're into winter sports, their quick-swap snow lenses move effortlessly between full sun to low-light environments. That's not all. Shady Rays offers the most insane protection in all of eyewear. Every pair of sunglasses is backed by lost or broken replacements. If you lose or break your pair, even on day one, they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. 
exclusively for our listeners. Shady Rays is giving out a very merry deal for the season. Go to ShadyRays.com and use the code SHAUN for 50% off two plus pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over a quarter million people. That's ShadyRays.com. Sean, S-H-A-U-N, for 50% off or two more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Link in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. Cheers. And then I left him for a bit and went back, but like I didn't know that he just his mother had just passed away and he was on tranquilizers at the time and I shouldn't have given him alcohol. And it just sent him on a mad one. But like me and him... He, when I went to prison, he ripped to me, he was sending me money. We made friends. I've still got a good bond with that guy, you know what I mean? Because it, I did want to go and do something really bad, yeah, because what he'd done. But when I spoke to his dad, like, and I said, listen, I had two big blades. I said, listen, I'm going to sl- carve you right up. He's like, look, please, let me explain why he's like this. He's just lost his mum. He's on tranquilizers, and you shouldn't give him a drink, you know, like, yeah, so that was mad, you know what I mean? Why did you get moved from Parkhurst to Swaleside? Well, no, from there I went from Parkhurst, yeah, to um, Coldingley. Um, and then, like, because I got a sea cat. And then, even while I was in um, Coldingley, like, I started doing um, the recovery program, you know, the rap 12 step. Because I had enough of, like, fucking having a, like, a gram a day habit, still in jail, three and a half years after I've been sentenced. I still had a habit that I was maintaining i just had enough i was busted and i was going through some treatment at the time because i'd contracted a bloodborne virus and i was on um some serious treatment for hepatitis i I contracted hepatitis c and um i was on some medication and it they declared me clinically insane like because i was having violent outbursts i was sensitive to like all my teeth went wobbly like so they stopped the treatment and I'd had enough. I was in the block broken and some people came from a course and they offered me an opportunity to try and turn my life around. And that's when like, I went through the process of reporting the uh, horrific sexual abuse and exploitation that I'd suffered as a kid. And I started my journey of recovery, you know, and I managed to, uh, I started getting involved with the church and that and like I was going to the choir, you know, stuff like that. And then, I managed to convince the parole board that I'd found God, yeah, because I was trying to do anything to get out, you know, and they sent me to, um, I got parole, you know, and they sent me to a therapeutic community in in Devon, but it was like a cult. It was a Christian rehab and, like, they were enforcing, like, God onto you and all that. And I did the initial program called the Genesis Program, and um, that was 12 weeks. So I managed to, my mate had a recovery house in Plymouth, and my NA sponsor, he um, put me in contact with that guy and I went there and um, I was doing really good. I was maintaining clean, but I was still drinking. I, went, I wasn't using drugs, I was still drinking. And um, I ended up inviting some chick down from my area, you know, because I had a nice penthouse flat looking out over the sea, like nice. My mate was living in Manila at the time, so I was renting his property off of him. And um I ended up inviting this woman down and we got into an argument and um, shipped me over there with a bottle and I ended up getting um, the old bill come and I ended up spitting blood at a paramedic and a copper. They had to shoot me with a beanbag, you know, like, you know, like to control me, tasered me. I was like mad and like ended up getting, I ended up going, I woke up in the hospital and then I woke up in the police station, but they were more interested in what, she done to me because I had that, that big scar on my head there. Like oh, they yeah. wanted to get her for attempted murder, yeah. But I like she had a lot few kids that so I didn't want to say nothing, yeah. So in the end I got bailed. I went back to the flat. It's exactly it's exactly the same layout as this flat, yeah. God. And it was like a crime. It was like a murder scene in there. Handprints everywhere. So I was like, my God, like it was bad. I'd lost about three pints of blood, you know, like they had to give me a transfusion. That's how much blood I'd lost. Like, and um, they put a core hole in my head there as well because my brain was swelling, you know, like I see it somewhere. Yeah. They had to release the pressure on that because I had fractured skull. Like, and from that, like it affected my, um, I, I, it was diagnosed that it affected my um, frontal lobe which is all my memories, my emotions and stuff like that. But I ended up getting 
23 day sentence for common assault yeah no charges nothing to do with domestic or nothing and because i was an ipp prisoner and it was against public service people i was told i had a blatant disregard for authority and i was made to go back to prison and do every single offending behavior course that i'd done so i spent another six year four month on a recall do you know what i mean right did she get anything for that no, nothing, no, because I didn't say nothing, you know what I mean? No. Which prison did you go this time? Um, uh, I went to Exeter first, uh, Exeter first I went to, and then um, I went to Bullender and they kicked me out of there because that's my local jail and I don't normally laugh so that long because I'm always causing trouble. Then I, I, Exeter, yeah. is that the one on the coast? Yeah, no, down Exeter's, in, um, I used to live right by that prison yeah. and they can, they all look out the window and shout at you. Yeah, you can, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's opposite, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, but no. They let fireworks off at night and all that over there. And I was getting loads of parcels thrown over there because I was local to that area, innit? It's right in the centre of, of, yeah, the, of the city. Town, yeah, Exeter town, yeah. Is it nice, that prison? No, where it's quite an horrific prison. Like, there's like, honest to God, while I was there, there's about eight suicides in that time I was in that prison. Like, yeah, there was, it's quite horrific. There's not a lot of, there's, there's a regime there, you know, like you're banged up a lot. You can't get out. The only time you can get out is go and exercise. But yeah, I, there was, I, there was about eight suicides in the space of a year or something that I was there. You know what I mean? Did you establish yourself there? Yeah, that's why I got kicked out of there because, like, um, yeah, I was on the enhanced wing. I managed to blag myself onto the enhanced wing. And um, I went on my parole and um, they'd been recording me over the blue phone, like, and they said that um, I was running a drugs empire from the blue phone, so they gave me a 15-month knockback. So I went back to the wing and I rolled a big spliff. I said, you know what, f*** you and f*** the wing. I just started getting loads, like, there's a security governor there, yeah, and um, I knew him from Dartmoor, yeah, like, and uh, I was in kind of like a little battle with him, like, because I was getting like socks thrown over, and I say, hey, play is there any football on today, Gov? And he say, why? I say, six and nil, mate, like, because they were catching some, I was getting some, so I ended up getting shipped out of there, I went from Bullingdon, um, no, from there to Bullingdon, and they put me with an officer, my offender supervisor, that I'd ended up getting into a fight with and breaking their rib a few years before. And I was like, this is conflict of interest. Now you're in charge of my destiny. No, I don't want this. And I said, all I'm in here for is spitting. I spat on a wall. So like, um, I see you taking me away from all my family. I spat on the photos. I just know I shouldn't have done that, but I was in the mad state. So then they sent me to um, Royal Prison in up in Rugby. And that was mad there. Like, I had some mad times there as well. I ended up getting on the railings, having like the national squad, because I got electrocuted in the cell. So I ain't going back in that cell. Electrocuted? Yeah. yeah, I got electrocuted. I was boiling my kettle one day. Do you remember? Yeah, I was boiling my kettle one day. I fucking put my hand on it. I was in the cell with my power power computer. And I got a big bolt. I must have hit the wall about 30 miles an hour, yeah? And I said, I ain't going back in that cell, yeah, right? <laughs> Like, no way, it's a health and safety stuff. Because I know all the rules and regulations, yeah? Because I've broken most of them, you know what I mean? So I'm quite good. <laughs> like, I know, I, I was quoting the, like, the, like, health and safety rule 2005. I was quite, I said, I ain't going back in there. So yes, you are. You're getting wrapped up. I said, all right then, mate, yeah? They're like, bang up, it's lunchtime. I was like, no, mate, I ain't banging up. So I got on the railings, like standing on the railings threatening to jump they put a big blew a big bouncy castle up and had the negotiators there of a board and all that it was actually in the newspapers like they said oh they tried to say they didn't say it was because i was electrocuted oh man refuses to bang up and he's giving tasty's chicken they like went and got me a load of tasty chicken is that to what get you me. yeah yeah did you see it on it's on the internet yeah oh my god like but they didn't say it was for um they didn't say it was for the electrocution i feel like i got yeah. celebrity in <laughs> yeah like that like that's what they done they wrote on there it's on the internet like prisoners refused to bang up because of no food no i didn't bang up not bang up for that because i was electrocuted <laughs> like and he went and got me chicken no because they have negotiated there with a board and that you were you like I mean? get me that chicken yeah i said i ain't banging up. i said no i ain't banging up i'm like i've missed my dinner i've missed everything they're like please if you get down we're going to get you some food i'm like you're not going to get me what i ordered and like they were like look what do you want and they went and got me it, like a little box of chicken they took me to the block but like I was even getting homely from the block to go back into the wing because I said, I'm refusing to go back to that wing because 
no way, it's dangerous. You put me in there now. So I was just blagging it, playing on it. You know what I mean? They were like, look, even though you're in the block, like we're going to reintegrate you back into the thing. You've got a thing called a behavioral compact, yeah? Like if you abide to certain things, like we'll let you do certain things, you know? So I managed to blag and I got back to that same wing. Like it was good. It was a mad jail there, like. Was there no hostility towards you after doing that? Yeah, the screws hated me. Yeah, Lizzie and that, yeah, and the big, the SO, yeah. Cause they, but yeah, yeah, they're not proper officers. They're like security guards, what you get in Sainsbury's. Like, like you know what I'm on about G4S? You see them, don't you? Like, they're like bang up. You're like, yeah, I'm well, not banging up. It's chaos there. <laughs> like, they're all downstairs drinking distilled. Like, it was... Like there was no control there, but it was a good place, man. It was a, I, I, like a few of my good pals are there, so like yeah, it was quite good. It was good to stay like for jail, but then they changed it to a uh, sex offenders prison. Like so, they were dispersing everybody, and like the people I've been could behave in. I ended up getting a C cat, and I got out of it because I was a B cat, high risk. And I like I'm not, I'm not going to that prison. I'm not going to that one. Like, Look. I was like, I need to get back down south, you know, like you got me in the Midlands here. I can't get no visit. And I went to Rochester after that, you know what I mean? And that was a crazy place. Like, that's like Spice City, you know what I mean? It's like, they call it, they call it, call, call it Temptation Island, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, because there's so much going on there, like, and there's no control there. Like, that was the first establishment that I've been to where they had young offenders mixed in with adults. That's what they had. So it was carnage there, like, it was mad. What sort of things would go down there? Like, a lot of stabbings and like, there's a lot of, like, young London gangbangers, there's a lot of them there, you know what I mean? So like, we, we were all right, because we we're an older generation, like, but the kids were so unruly, a lot of stabbings, a lot of like, hot waterings, and this, it's just like, but that took the heat off of us for what we were doing. Do you know what I mean? So we didn't used to mind it. You know what I mean? Distracting, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I had the job as the grounds orderly there, yeah? Like nobody else was allowed out in the perimeter. You know, like you have, it's like stage one lockdown, isn't it? No one was allowed out in the grounds then. But because I was, the, I'd done the recycling qualification, yeah? Like, and <laughs> waste management, yeah? I'd done that, yeah? I was the only person that was allowed out, even if it was a code red or code blue or whatever. So I was still going out there picking up my packs, you know what I mean? But um, I'm getting it thrown over in flower pots and then collecting it from the garden. But I said to my pal Desi, I said, listen, he was my pal and used to do it with me. And um, I said, do not do nothing for them Brixton boys, yeah? Stay away from them. We're doing our thing. Yeah, I'm working with some other boys from South London, yeah? I said, don't do nothing with them. If you get into bed with them, it's going to be like Pete. Hey, I'll come back to the wing. I'm like, where's Desi? I like banged up. I was like, why are you banged up? He's like, bully stabbed me in the leg, mate. I was like, what do you mean? Like, he stabbed my power. And my power ended up setting a cell on fire and all that. Like, it was quite mad there, you know what I mean? And then I went, then I went through a very, very traumatic time. My sister just had a baby and uh, is on crucial life support and that. And that kind of like, uh, and my nan, my nan, had, my nan was, had passed away and, um, like I was going through a bad time, like, so I ended up getting myself put in a block to get shipped out, but How? Like, um, just by kicking off. But then they let me out again. I just wanted out of the jail, you know, because of all the arms house for them people, like what my power brought. I just kept playing up, like kicking off. And in the end, one day I just got on the healthcare roof, like, because I knew if I got on the roof, they'd take me to a B-cap. But I'd already packed my stereo full of loads of stuff. Did so they have I the big... Um What's it called Bouncy Castle out again? No, not for that. They didn't. I just got down in the end. I was, as soon as it started raining, I got down about nine <laughs> o'clock that night. Yeah, yeah Sorry, I because got it down, started yeah. raining. Yeah, I got down. Yeah, and it was get. I was getting cold. All that was one of them prison body warmers on, so I got down. Yeah, but I knew where they were going to send me. Yeah, they were going to send me to Swellside, but they didn't. They put me to El Elmley and then downgraded me to a B cap, but I'd already packed my Sony Gigajuke stereo full of mobile phones and spice and bits of resin. So when I arrived at Swellside, I went on a wing two weeks later, my stuff had already been bagged up and they just gave it to me as a TX. And that's when I, I started my little hustle there as well. But Swellside is the worst prison in the country. Like out of all the jails I've been to, like high security prisons and stuff, that is the most violent, dangerous environment I've ever been in. You know what I mean? 
Like, that's where I saw the other people. There's a lot of stabbing. I see a geezer get stabbed about 80 times there, like, from one I of his... I think we should break that one down. Yeah. Over what? Uh, oh, it's like, he's, he runs somebody over and got a sentence for that, and they put a hit on him. They put a million-pound hit on him. So they said, yeah. The person he'd run over? Yeah, their family. Like, they're quite <sighs> a high-profile family. I'm going to mention no names, yeah, but quite a high-profile family from the West Midlands. They put a big hit on this guy because he murdered this person. So, like, they called him in. Like, they were all friends. Like, that's how they made it out. And what you do in that jail, yeah, if you want to get someone, you push a bell on another wing. And wherever you are, when that bell goes off, you get locked on that spur. You're trapped, yeah? So that's what they done. They orchestrated an alarm bell and they went in and they served him up, like stabbed him about 70 times. I've never heard what happened to that guy afterwards. I was going to ask, did he live? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Like, it was horrific. He got took in the, air, in the helicopter. Like, it was horrific. You know what I mean? All right, Nathan. So you said after that guy got stabbed, you were telling James a bit extra. Yeah, like, um, like when I was speaking to the officers, like, because we were asking what happened to the guy and the officers were saying, look, we didn't have enough blood here, yeah, to keep putting it back in. You know, from the health healthcare department, the, he had so many puncture wounds that, like, it, they couldn't stem where it was coming from. So that's why they had to lift him, airlift him straight to, I think it was Guy's Thomas, you know, like the closest hospital, like, like to save his life. But I never heard nothing about that after that. You know what I mean? Like, the people what done it, they did get apprehended. So, like, I do know that part of it, you know. So, there was a time when you fell off a prison roof. Oh yeah, what happened is, um, I was I was given um a, an open status in Wales, yeah, and I went to a jail called Prescoid, and in the beginning it was a good environment. I was like working out on the farm every day, and then one day. I was having a, just about to get my first town visit. So they called me down to the office, like, Brooks to control, Brooks to control. So I got called down there, but I've been drinking, like, in the billet. So um, I called me down and said, right, it's Natasha Brooks and Wendy Townsend signing you out on Saturday. I'm like, yeah, that's who's signing me out. He went, hang on a minute, buddy, have you been drinking? And I thought I'd been drinking just vodka, so he can't smell it. He went, I know you've been to Lincoln, bud. I said, no. He said, right, you're coming Good with accent. me. Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. He goes, you're coming with me. We're going to the gatehouse. So he got the breathalyzer and he's like, I was like, oh. so I've got a bad lung, but I can't really do it. You know, like, got asthma and all that. He's like, yeah, one more last blow. And he banged it. He said, the fucking thing's not working. He duped me, yeah. He said, it's not working, buddy. He said, give it one big blow. I thought, yes, I'm out of here. I went, Phew. he goes, that's 132. He said, you're banned from driving and you're not, and you're going to Swansea, he said. So I said, I ran back to the billet because I know they're going to search the billet, like. So I ran back. I said to all of my pals, I was like, listen, get rid of everything. So we just took all the alcohol, like in little lockers we had it, and put it all in the showers and they come on the wing and they like started te like looking for everyone. A couple more people got breath tested. Like they're like, you're like, excuse my language, like you've fucking messed it up for us. So like I thought, I said to myself, mate, I'm going to sleep. So I went and smoked a joint. 12 o'clock that night, my cellmate Miki's like woke me. I was like, Brooksy, Brooksy, Brooksy. Cause that's when they do the check at 11 o'clock, yeah. Like, Brooksy, 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 wake up. I was like, what do you mean wake up? Like, he's like, come on, we're going. I've packed your bags and that, yeah. I was like, come on, I don't want to do it, mate. I've only got like seven weeks left or something. I don't want to run off. Like, I'd rather just go to Swansea. I've got a load of path and a load of gear to take with me. Like, I'd gone and seen my mate back on the other wing. And um, then he f***ing booted the fire exit open. So me and him are now running. The alarm's going off. And I didn't know where I was. The only field I've ever run across is a football pitch. <laughs> These fields are going on for miles, mate, yeah? And I said, look, over there, let's go over there and get a car. He goes, you don't want to go there because I was in the Brecon Beacons. He goes, that's where they do the SAS training camp, you know, like that. I said, I can't go there, let's go down. So it took, took us about an hour and a half to get down into the Valley of Us, like going through marshes and all that, yeah? Even me and him had a punch up over it while we were still escaping, pissed out the reds, like brutal fight, you know what I mean? But like, we just, anyway, we got to some woman's place like five in the morning, so left at 12, got there at five in the morning. 
And like seeing this bird, I was like waterlogged, completely bogged out. I was like, look, I need to change my clothes. And I was like, oh, where are you from anyway? She's like, I'm from Reading, Calcutta. I was like, what? That's where I'm from. So I managed to phone somebody up who I knew in Newport, yeah? My mate called Robbie. So I said, listen, I've escaped, mate. I need some money and I need to get back to my area. He's like, look, you've been on the news, like, <laughs> like you've got to stay where you are, like, so... I went to Cardiff and I managed to get on the busy train in the rush hour about five o'clock that night. I just blended in, I fell asleep. I woke up, went to my girlfriend's house and I went and had a smoke with a few of my pals and um, went back to Berkshire. But my mum found out that I was in the area and she was trying to find me to grasp me up to get me put back in there because she knew that if I carried on on this run there would be a mad like escalation of criminality in that so she just wanted me to be caught you know like and i'd already packed a big bag i was gonna go and have myself in i had a big fat parcel up my bum like and um i thought you know what i'm gonna rob these little jamaicans before i go back like because i knew that they were selling white and b so i've gone to this flat and um they were, there was loads of people there clucking and I was like, where are them guys gone? They're like, I've gone to do a reload. So I had bits on me, so I served a few of them up. So I thought, I've got to go to Reading and get another pack now. So I went with my pal and, and another guy in a van. And then when I got back, I sorted everybody out and there was a knock at the door. I just had a pipe and I thought, no way. It looked like, these guys looked like some big bodybuilding surfer dudes. And I put on a... a voice was a guy called Dennis I put on an old man's voice says hello how can I help you <laughs> they were like it's the police I opened the door but I thought someone was coming to rob me so I put all my shit away quick put it in my back pocket next minute I bang the door come off so I went across but this is what had happened while I'd been in jail I used to live in that same flat with my daughter's mum so I had the perfect escape route but since I've been in jail, the whole architectural structure had changed. They knocked down the back of the building and made it into a car park and made a new pizza shop in it. So normally I run across this flat roof, up a slope, slide down a slope and I'm gone. But I ran up this slope and there's a sheer drop and I fell 36 feet. <gasps> like, but I, had, I had a replica fire on me, but like, I was more interested in getting rid of the gun. And I managed to get up and put the gun in a... Uh, in a Grundon bin, but it was like it was a setup because the police were there, like the whole high street was sealed off with police and I was just put into an ambulance like and taken to the hospital under armed guard. Like my mum, my sisters turned up, like I was in a geriatric ward because of my injuries, like broken bones with armed police, with Heckler and Koshes and like, like assault rifle guns, like guarding me and then I had to go back to prison. Uh, I went to a hospital and because of the significant damage to my feet, I had, um, it's called um, calcaneum fractures, but they were so extensively damaged, I had to wait three weeks because the bones had just shattered so they could mold it a bit back together so they could get an accurate x-ray reading. So I had to suffer all that traumatic pain and discomfort. I didn't care because I had a big parcel on me, like I said, yeah. So I was having, and then, I was in hospital for three months in traction. I had to go like, when I, I was there three months in the hospital, chained up to the guards. Like even when I was there, it was still a mad experience. I got friendly with officers. We had good days, like takeaways, it was all right. And um, <laughs> yeah, I built quite a good relationship with the staff there and that. And then, yeah, I'm trying to think what happened after that. Yeah, yeah so then, but while I was there, like I wrote a poem that was actually published. It's called Stop Never Run Again. Yeah, I wrote this poem. It's like, um, many strange things have happened to me, but I won't forget this for eternity. I'm currently locked up with two guards at my side because I thought I was clever and that I could hide. I went on a run, turned up at Bracknell Town, fell 36 feet straight onto the ground. <laughs> I've broken my arm and I've shattered my heels. It wouldn't have happened if I didn't do them deals. But it's woken me up, proper opened my eyes. I'm really lucky. I know I should have died. Look what can happen when you don't stop and think. Go and visit people who live for drugs and drink. But I'm out real soon and hopefully I'll walk again. But I'll be stuck with that thought, never run again. Wow. Yeah, and I, and I actually, I didn't know, but my mum had like um, 
written it down, like, and I've got it published, like, in magazines and that, like, because I'm quite good, like, with my words and that, like, that's how I, I kind of express myself, I'm quite good at poetry, but, like, yeah, it was a mad experience, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after the guy got stabbed 70, 80 times, um, whereabouts in the story at that point? Well, I managed to, I, like I said, I got sectioned for my mental health and for my own safety. I was in the healthcare department, yeah? And I had to go through a process of treatment before I was able to go in front of the parole board. I did go on there. My sister came and they were like, look, this guy's gone. Let him stay in the healthcare for another three or four months. And then you come back to us once you've had a psychological and psychiatric evaluation. And then we will see whether. And I, and I told them the truth about what happened and my past and how I got there. And I managed to get out. I got out. I got my parole, in I, Lynn, yeah? And um, like... My life started going really well then. I moved, I started um, doing construction work. Then I moved to the Southwest and I was with a girl. I was doing really well. I had like a few people working for me doing civil engineering groundwork. I've got some really good contracts and that. And then like, um, I had five deaths in a year. Like my granddad, my best mate, my old cellmate and a couple of other pals. So. Even though I was in a crowded house, there was eight of us in the house, I felt alone, do you know what I mean? And I ended up using again, you know, and I got in a bit of trouble and my partner stayed with me, supported me through it. And I ended up going out and doing something stupid with someone in my Jeep and they come to my house during COVID, even though I didn't get done for nothing because the Jeep was registered with my name. And they were like, right, when can we correspond with you? I was like, I don't know what's happened. Like, I left my Jeep somewhere. Somebody's obviously done something. Because I did. I left it at our uncle's yard and um, the MOT had failed. So I said, look, this is where I left it. I don't know nothing about it. And they're like, oh, no problem. As it's COVID, um, we're going to need to correspond with you via the post. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Like, um, don't put me at Reading, like, because I'm here. So anyway, the officers ripped down the address in Western Supermare. Anyway, he's walked off and I thought, sweet, I've done it. Like, cause there's like armed police coming out and I managed to blag them. Next thing they come back, a van's pulled up. They're like, Mr. Brooks? I'm like, yeah. They went, do you realise you're on life licence, don't you? I was like, yeah. I've already left a message with the probation, but due to the office being closed, they hadn't picked it up because it was COVID. So they said, right, you're now being recalled to prison for being at an address where you're not meant to be residing. Even though I was allowed to stay there and I got recalled for another 17 months. But that was like, I lost my relationship. I lost my business. I lost everything, you know, so... And, but I, I got I got managed to get parole straight away because I said they were like, because um, of my sentence, like I'm on this IPP sentence. So I said to the parole board, like when he said to me, he said, Mr. Brooks, you're here today. I said, where were you when the COVID-19 pandemic struck? And he was like, we were told to be at home with our families. I said, yeah, so was I. Yeah, I was condemned to incarceration on a sentence that don't even exist. Like, why am I being punished? And the judge said, look, I've got no further questions. And I got my parole, you know what I mean? And I was, I got back out and got was working for my pal. I was doing really well, and um, I was doing um, drainage, like working in the drainage and sewer systems. And unbeknown to me, I'd contracted um, a flesh-eating bug in my body, and I kept feeling ill and sweating out and that. I was telling my partner, and she thought I was blagging it, like I was on drugs. Or I was, so I went for Christmas and. Um, I said, I feel really ill, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's because you went to the strippers last night. It's your own <laughs> fault, self-inflicted, like, yeah, I got no, go in there and go to sleep. Yeah, you know, like, she gave me a bit of grief and that, like, and I said, I feel, feel rough, man. Say it's not right. So we had Christmas, like, we had a good time. And I left and I started saying inside me, I felt like I never ever felt before. I was shaking inside, sweating, but I was thinking, is it because I had a bit no gear for a little while or whatever? And I didn't know, yeah? And I got back and she's throwing me, she's all right, you got back all right. I'm like, yeah, oh, sorry, you're all right. Everyone in the house has got COVID. I think you need to get a check. I'm like, all right, so I got a check positive for COVID, yeah? If you're looking for a gift, my new book, Sit Downs with Gangsters, is available worldwide on Amazon. We've interviewed over a 1,000 people now and we selected 10 of the hardest-hitting stories to go in this book. Each chapter features the story of one of our podcast guests, 
Those stories are Shane Taylor, Knife Maniac's Redemption, John Elite, Mafia Hitman for the Gambino Crime Family, Joey Barnett, 35 years in UK prison, Ian Blink McDonald, £6 million bank robber, Chet Sandu, Asian smuggler in Spanish Supermax, John Lawson, the hit team commander, David Macmillan, international smuggler's Thai death row prison escape, John Abbott, San Quentin prison shootout and escape, Michael Francis, Colombo crime family capo portrayed in Goodfellas. And Wildman, English enforcer in Arizona prison. Link in description box on YouTube, available worldwide on Amazon. Also, my next book, Untouchable Jimmy Savile, is getting published in December 2023. So check that out as well. It will be available worldwide on Amazon. Thank you for listening. Cheers. So I've got to isolate myself now. I've gone to the shops. I'm bumped into an older social. I'm like, I can't talk to you. I can't come near you because I've got COVID. And I end up going back to my house. I went and bought a bit of gear. I'll be honest, I went and bought some white, yeah? Like, I was having a smoke and this guy was there. And I was like, I don't feel well. You know what I mean? Like, big, this big thing come up on my leg, yeah? So I thought, it's saying, I could feel something. It felt, I don't know if it, I was thinking, is it the drugs doing this to me? Like, because I have thought before that I've had creatures inside me and that, you know, when you're, it's like hallucination. And at the time, so I popped this thing, yeah, on my leg. It was just there. It's only a little spot now, but like, what it led to was like horrific, life changing for me, yeah. So I popped this thing anyway, this thing come out and it was like a little, like a little jelly blood clot. And I've, at the time, it was all in the press, like a lot of people that have had the COVID jabs are now getting blood clots and dying. I thought, I need to get these out because I'm going to die otherwise, yeah? But I did not know. And then I felt, I feel something in there. So I'm digging about. And what I was picking at was my artery. And I popped oh. my artery in my leg. And um, all the blood, it was like, these lot went and cleaned it up afterwards. I don't know what it's like because like, I, I think I cleaned it up as good as I could, but it squirted everywhere. And I managed to stem the bleeding. I went to an out of hour surgery, yeah? I was like, look, my leg, like, I'm in pain. I like, like, you need to give me some antibiotics. They're like, no, we can't do nothing, get out. So I'm, they, I went back in there. I thought, F that, I'm going back in. I barged my way straight back into the consultant. I'm like, you need to help me now, like. And they were like, no, they threw me out. Security escorted me out of the building. I could hardly walk. They were like, if it gets worse, phone an ambulance. I was like, listen, I ain't even got a phone. Like, I ain't got no one to help me because I fell out of my family and stuff. Like, and um, I went, I went, I went back to my house that night. I never, ever, ever felt like that in my life. It was like I had, um, it was like my body, an out of body experience. My body was floating away above me. Like, I was having out of body experiences. Um, it's delirium, what I've been diagnosed with now. Um, but um, unbeknown to me, because I now I had this flesh-eating bug in my leg called necrophysizing fasciitis, uh, it had now entered my bloodstream and it, it was shutting my organs down. But I woke up five that morning, I knew something was right, rock, rock, right. And I kicked the guy out and I managed to get on a train. But I thought, how am I meant to ride my bike? Like, because my legs were swollen, couldn't move them. So I got off a station early, a, a, a station early, called early, yeah? Because I knew that it was all downward, downhill. So I could just right, roll down the hill. And I went into the um, hospital and I just pulled my strides down in, in the reception. I was like, you need to help me. Like, and then next minute, bam, I woke up 13 days later. My sister, like, Nathan, Nathan. I was like, all right. I couldn't even move. I showed you the video earlier, innit, yeah? Like, she's like, can you move your feet? Can you move your hands? And I was like, I don't even know what's going on. Like, like, even still now, I can't remember exactly what happened. I thought I'd been in a rave, an anarchy rave in Liverpool. That's what I was saying to my family. Like this, because... <laughs> But she was like, there's been a horrific, tragic accident. Like, you've lost half your legs. But I was so, like, immobile. I couldn't even lift my head, like. And it, they didn't show me for about two weeks, did they? Because they said the shock could have killed me. Just to clarify for the viewers then, you showed us a picture and your thigh, it had been completely eaten away. Eaten yeah. away, yeah. Both completely, of them. both of them, yeah. And you said leeches earlier. Yeah, it's like, it's like a, a staphylococcal bug. Like, it eats... It's like, a, they get it in feces and stuff like that. Like, it's a staphylococcal bug, like, from the strep family, like, and it 
like it was going around my body anyway. It was like a little blemish to start off with a blood blister, like like a love bite kind of thing on my leg. And I didn't think nothing of it, but because I then popped my artery, this is what they told me earlier, that when I arrived there, they were like, how did you even get here? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Well, this is like three weeks after I woke up. I still didn't know how I got there. You didn't like, get it from the chicken dippers. No, do you know what I mean? Like, it was mad. <laughs> like, I like, how did you even get I like, I don't even know. Like, it was, it like, it's mad. Like, even now still, I can't remember everything, yeah? But like that then affected me. I woke up from that coma and like I was completely like my sister tell her I was completely confused. Like, so what was the psychological damage? Um, like I was, I, I was like um, suffering from like hallucinations, delirium. Like I thought that I'd been, I thought that I was in prison and Pete, someone had died in the bed next to me. I was coming out some mad stuff. I thought I'd been at a rave in Liverpool with an anarchy thing with SL2 and that. I, that's what I was saying to my family. Like, they were like, they were like, how did you even get it? I was like, well, I was at the rave in Liverpool, anarchy on top of the speakers. And I think I fell off the speakers and uh, my legs. That's how I done it. So they're like, no, Nathan, like, there's been a tragic, this is not a joke. It's been a tragic thing. Like, you never like, and it, it took me, like, I was released from the hospital and due to it being still in COVID um, restrictions, there was no support available for me. I got out of the hospital in January, no, March. I was there from January till March and I got out in March and they said the first available stuff with a critical aftercare team was in May or August. That's when they were starting up. So I was left, I come out of that hospital and... Um, uh, I ended up falling out with my sister's fella whose house I was living in because I had some unsavory people in his property when he's a very professional man and like he didn't appreciate it. and I got into a, um, a verbal altercation with him and I, was, I, I feel sorry now I was threatening towards him and my even my, my sister like she was put in a position I was told I had to leave that house and I was like well what am I meant to do? take a three bedroom house on my backpack. Like, no, I'm not moving my stuff out. I was a bit obstructive for a little while. And then I was sleeping in doorways and car parks and all that, like, like it was mad. And then I bumped into some woman, like, and I got into a relationship which was like unstable, like due to her past personal experiences and stuff. It was a, it was a, um, a dysfunctional relationship and, I ended up back on the drugs, like I was so low. Like I even started injecting crack cocaine in my body, you know, like it was mad. And I was getting into all kinds of scrapes and I had some mad fights. Then, then I was like turning, phoning up, like fighting the boxers and cage fighters on the street for getting involved in my domestics and like got knocked off my bike, got another mad infection. And then like, I was meant to go to my ex-partner's and because it was the twins' birthday and because I'd been smoking drugs and her mum had told her she wouldn't let me go, I ended up going, getting smashed out my head and I went out with someone and then there was, I smashed a window like and in, a, in during an offence and like I'd, I got arrested. But in a way I was glad, yeah, that I got arrested because I was so messed up like my... So I I didn't even apply for bail. I could have got bail. The other geezer got bail, but I was like, I was busted. I was burnt out, like, and um, I went back to prison and I spent another 11 months there. But, like, during that 11 months, I took myself away from my local establishment. I was sent to an establishment in Nottingham and um, that gave me the opportunity to explore all these new diagnoses. It's something that I'd never done before. Like, I got there and I was like, listen, even a woman said, um, this woman, she was my mental health worker. When I first got there, I was like, Aggie, like, listen, I'm not coming to this jail. Like, like it was mad. Like, and, um, and then I said to her, look, I'm not sharing a cell with no one because I've got hypodelirium, post-traumatic stress. Like, not put, say I mentioned to blag I've got a single cell. And then, this woman, I was my worker, I explained everything that had happened. And I said, look, I just want to know, it's all right you give me all these labels, emotionally unstable personality disorder, hypo delirium, post-traumatic stress, um, like there was loads of other little things like um, <laughs> drug-induced psycho. I just wanted to find out about 
that stuff. So I said, look, can you go away and get me some information? Because I... Like it has changed my life a lot. I've changed my whole, it's changed my whole personality, that trauma experience of the coma. But I like the way I am now. Even though I'm a bit odd in my ways now, some of the stuff I come out with is a bit weird and that. I learned ways to cope with those feelings of anxiety and dysfunction and distress. Like I do art now and I write poems now and I do press ups and dips. And like when I'm feeling anxious or stressed, I learn coping strategies rather than turn into drugs like I have in the past. And I've actually come out like a lot better person now. And um, I'm trying to get on the right path and stay on it. You know what I mean? I've been like, I've got now, because I've told them exactly what went wrong. I've now got the support that I've been asking for for the last 30 years. Like I've got the support from the ERMS team, which is psychological interventions. Like, so I'm getting trauma-based therapy, um, psychological like training, psycho work, dr drama workshops. Like I've been doing that now since I've come out, and now I'm actually growing. Like I feel like in the last little few couple of months, say in the last year and a half, I've achieved more now than I have in the last thirty years. And I'm happy with the way I am now. Like I said, even though some of the stuff I come out with is a bit bizarre and that sometimes, like, but like, I'm on a good journey now, you know, and I've got a positive support network and I'm being honest and open. That's why I'm doing this today. Like, I was a lot of apprehension about doing this, but like, I want to get, like, I've got the qualifications to help people with mentoring and emotional well being support. Like, and I've been doing that stuff. So, through this transition, it's enabling me to give something back. Because all I've ever done is take and take and take. And yeah, I want to be able to try and give something back to the community and get involved in like this kind of thing, spreading the word, spreading the message and letting people know that even though you've been through all that dark, traumatic, horrific stuff, yeah, if you search deep within inside yourself that like I have, I had to do some real bad soul searching and relive some of that mad, horrific stuff. Like, from that, I'm kind of like, from a little seed, I'm growing gradually, you know? And like, that's that's where I've got to right now. And I feel in quite a good position, you know? And I've been doing, I've been have the opportunity from one of my friends, Rachel, like she's been doing like um, motivational speaking and things like that. And I got involved recently with an uh, organization called Expert Focus and they're like lived experience, um, link work and stuff and they do like surveys and i've done one recently regarding like my experiences of homelessness mobile testing suites bloodborne viruses and i was able to give my experiences in um in a like in a zoom call and from that now in the next couple of weeks i'm going to king's college university to go and do uh a motivational speaking lived experience um with this company again so I'm trying to use my negative experiences now to like let other people make awareness like the disadvantaged people there's an advantage to what we've been through you know and like that's that well that's where I'm at now you know what I mean so I'm just trying to move forward now you know Congratulations David and you've written your own book as well haven't you Yeah when I was in prison in Parker so um, I was doing a I was doing an access course so I had to do English writing English literature and creative writing and um I was at, like, I had to write a chapter of my life, yeah? Just one chapter during a, a syllabus, you know? And I gave it to my lecturer and he's like, wow, that's really good. You should carry on doing it. And at the time I was on substances still, with, with stimulant substance. And I used to write for hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, I did, I'm being honest. Like, I was, I, I was on Subutex, you know, Subutex. I was on that and like, if, like, like, if when you take it, it gives you a buzz. So I was able to write like, 30, 40 pages in a day, yeah? <laughs> and then like, what I'd do is I'd send it to my other sister, she'd proofread it, edit it, and then send it back to me. And then like, I submitted that to a guy called Terry Green. He's like a, the lecturer for Southampton University. And he's like, you know what, bam. And I, in my, my work, it was only like a level three qualification, like A level qualification, you know, like an access. From that, I was awarded a level eight merit for dedication in my English writing and authoring my first short story. So like, I think my sister and that Terry still got all of those transcripts, but because I was mixed up in so much of the 
the drama of my life. I never went back to that, but I like, I, I would like to get that my word out there. I'm thinking about now, I spoke to my support workers about writing a book about the IPP and what I've been through. And um, just to get people like, I was going to put IPP, impossible prison sentence, you know, like that's what it is to me, like getting away from that. But like, I'm going through the process now because I haven't done any violent offences since 2006. My case is now of, um with the public protection and hopefully in the very near future, as long as I maintain sobriety and no criminality, I'm actually going to get this thing took off, you know what I mean? So hopefully it will, you know, but I can only, if I continue doing my what I'm doing now, I've got a good prospects of it, you know, so that's exactly where I am now, you know? Yeah, one of our very first guests, Pepsi Watson, if you want to watch that yeah, I know, podcast, yeah, Pepsi he's Watson, campaigned yeah. for IPP and he's back in now, recalled. And yeah. It's, he went through hell during the uh, pandemic because he said there was people self-harming and yeah it's changed the whole prison really, environment the environment changed. was very stressful for people yeah there's a lot of self-harm yeah and a lot of a lot of people try crying out for help really but there's no help like that 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 covid has changed the whole prison system like before you used to be able to get a bit of help now the screws are lazy i'm not criticizing them because they're understaffed and there's not no resources available but it is it has changed there's a lot of people still suffering like i've got my ex-partner's family she's like still stuck on this sentence there's so many people stuck on this barbaric sentence that was found to be inhumane and unlawful but we're still like living on it and I, i've been saying anybody that endorses my detention is actually committing a criminal offense saying that torture is all right but no one's not listening now you know what i mean like but they are it's starting to come out in the media a bit and like you've got ungrip and families are for us and like there is like now but, but not like i that's why i end up getting put on a hunger strike i'll get put on an act while i was in prison this time because they gave us all this information all these ipps right what we're going to do is we're going to resentence you all like resentence me well, i've done 18 years yeah my tower was due two years done nine times my amount of time so what are you going to give me so i went on a hunger strike for 12 days you know what i mean like, but nothing come of it. Like, all I've done is was hungry, you know? <laughs> like, so, like, there's low, at the moment, there's a lot of people, like, that are campaigning for that to be overtook, but there's not enough speculation. Fair enough, it's in the courts, the MPs talk about it and all that, but nobody doesn't know what it's like until you've lived it. And I'm still trapped, you know? Like, I feel enslaved, like, when I sent a message. That's what I, I feel enslaved, you know? Like, my very every move is monitored. If like I've got to be yes sir, no sir, three bags full. So it's not it's not a good thing to be on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Any more questions, Jen? No, I I wanted to ask. In your eighteen years, you must have come across some sex offenders. Yeah, they're all integrated in the system now. It's crazy. Like you got to sign a compact in certain prisons to live next door to a sex offender. It's it's crazy. Like you know what I mean? But do you, obviously, what happened to you when you were younger, if and. What did you do about it when you met them? Well, when I was in Dartmoor, yeah, I did get into a bit of conflict. Like I threw a, I threw a bit of hot water over somebody because he was he was a nonce. Like, but all I did, what happened then is I got moved wings and I got told off because I signed a compact to say that I wouldn't discuss or in you got to sign compacts on the wings now. Like, and you're not allowed to say nothing, talk about your crimes. It's mad. Like, and they're like in there, they're protected. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and they they shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like. Like, I don't, like, obviously, like, my abusers, like, I've got a lot of hate and venom towards them. But if I go and do something to them, then I'm going to be in jail for the rest of my life. So I'm trying to move forward from that by getting this trauma counselling and all that, like. And what was it like when you first sort of opened your wounds? Yeah, it was horrific, man. Like, I was on a course. Like, I, 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 I said to Sean earlier, like, they said to me on the 12 step program in Dartmoor, I got deselected from it because they said, when was the first time he was intoxicated? And I said, listen, I can't tell you about that. It's too horrific. And then they were like, look, we believe this is a public protection issue. So, through the confidentiality clause, if the person's people or public or we've got a duty to report it and that's what i did like i took the courage to report. i spoke to these lot my sister and my family like because they were unaware i kept it hidden like for 23 years you know but like i got kicked off that course because like i was still using but i went through the process 
And my abuser didn't even go to prison, do you know what I mean? Because he blagged his mental health and physical health and that. Like, my dad, like, even got arrested for, like, for contempt of court. Like, he's like, you're not fit to sit on the top of a Christmas tree. You call yourself a judge. Like, his geese is a perfect paedophile, like, you know? Yeah. Disgusting, isn't it? The whole justice system's upside down. So is there anything that you'd like to say in conclusion then to the viewers who've watched this for the last two hours? Um, yeah, I just want to say, like, um, I hope that you don't think, like, my some of my stories, what I've done, I'm not trying to glamorise what I've done or nothing. Like, I'm just trying to be open, honest, and, like, just letting people know that, like, even if you're in that dark, deep hole, there is a way out, you know what I mean? As long as you can try and reach out, you've got, like, you can try and change for the parole board, try and change for your family, try and change for your kids and mum or whatever. You've got to try and change yourself, you know, like, change comes from within and that's the first step to the wards rebuilding your life, man. And, like, even though I've been caught up in the criminal justice system for over 30 years, yeah, I'm trying to step away from it now. And I do believe... And I feel confident in myself, yeah, that I am going to be on the right path now. You know what I mean? And I don't want to face that demonic system ever again. Well said. And for people watching this, then, if they want to contact you for any opportunities, etc., is it Instagram? Is that your preferred? Yeah, on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we're going to put Nathan's link, Instagram link, in the description box below this video if you're watching it on YouTube. So if you do have any opportunities for him, get in touch. Uh, huge thank you let us know in the comments thank what you, you thought about this yeah, yeah thanks cheers. Man. thank you for thanks the being so honest yeah, yeah and thanks Jen as well back on yeah. the couch thanks to Lindsay <laughs> with Ziggy over there <laughs> thank you cheers, cheers. Chet Sandu's book is finally available worldwide on Amazon he's one of our most viral podcast guests ever the book is called Self Made Jews Paid an Asian kid who became an international drug smuggling gangster. Do you want to read some of the back, Jen? Yeah, go the blurb. In 1999, Chet Sandu was arrested at gunpoint in Alicante Airport for smuggling the largest quantity of illicit pharmaceutical drugs in Spanish history. Interesting. Overnight, he went from living in the shadows of the Costa del Crimes underworld to being labelled a notorious supervillain in the international press. Incarcerated alongside murderers, rapists, and terrorists in a super maximum security wing. He had to navigate a world of murderous knife fights, prison breaks, drug taking, and high stake power plays. Good bedtime read. In Self Made Jews Paid, learn how a British born Asian kid with disabilities raised in a corner shop emerged as a protector of his family from racist thieves and hooligans. Be prepared to be entertained, informed and offended by Chet's no-holes-barred account of raves, drugs, bodybuilding, entering the fashion industry. Did you know that he dated Kylie Minogue and Naomi yes. Campbell? <laughs> latest interview. Working the doors and life in one of the world's deadliest places to be incarcerated. If you enjoyed Chet's podcast series with us, there's a lot more detail in the book. Check it out. Worldwide on Amazon, ebook, paperback, and audiobook.